So welcome to the plenary talk, the plenary lecture of Professor Maria Shodanovsky. I am Celina Figueiredo and will be the chair. I encourage you to use the chat to post questions and comments. So, uh, Guilherme, please. Uh, Maria, happy birthday. Thank you very much. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Maria. Birthday. Oh, wait, wait, can I take a picture of this? Can you hold it up? <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. I don't think that ever happened to me before. <laughs> and always, so always, to... always a way of conference on my birthday, but I don't think <laughs> I ever had a whole slide for myself. Thank you. Actually, I should mention that this card, this beautiful card, is, is by Yoshiko Wakabayashi. You know, Yoshiko is our uh, designer. We wow. have a designer at USP, and that's her, her art. It's very it's beautiful. beautiful, yes. So Thank today, we celebrate your birthday, Maria. And you give us a plenary talk. <laughs> so thank you for the gift. <laughs> Maria is well known in our Latin American combinatorics community. She was invited speaker at LACA 2004 in Santiago, the prehistory of the Lagos series. And she was invited speaker at ISMP 2006, the only time mathematical programming was held in the Southern Hemisphere and at many other occasions during the past 15 years. We are very grateful to her generosity. And today, her talk is about induced subgraphs and three decompositions. So now, Maria, please, you may share again your presentation. Thank you very much. Let me, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share again, as you say. Okay. Okay. Um, should I start? Yes, please. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, my pleasure to be here or to somewhat be here. I would much prefer to be there in person. Um, uh, so I have to apologize for the noise. I'm in the middle of a big city and occasionally there are sirens outside. I'll stop if that happens, but, uh, uh, but I'm sorry about that. And uh, another thing is, uh, so it's a pretty big group, but I think if you have a question, which is like a clarification question, it's best to ask it as it comes up, because uh, there's no point for me going on if, uh, if people don't understand something. Uh, so just just say it, don't put it in the chat, because I, uh, I'm not so organized that I can think about my talk and think about the chat at the same time. So if you need to ask me something, please just ask me something. Okay, so I'm talking about forbidden uh, induced subgraphs and 3D compositions. And this is really work I've been doing since the start of the pandemic. It's very, uh, uh, the time is very well defined. Okay, so, but let me, let me start with an introduction. Uh, so I'm a graph theorist, you know what graphs are, uh, they have vertices and edges. And for most of uh, my life, I've been studying uh, the structure of graphs that are defined by forbidden induced subgraphs, or to say it uh, less, uh, in a less complicated way, by graphs, families of graphs that are defined by forbidding certain structures obtained by deleting vertices, right? So you, you say, uh, this graph is in my family if I cannot delete vertices to get, to get a certain structure. Uh, so let me just remind you what an induced subgraph is. Uh, H is an induced subgraph of G. Is the, if, the vertex is of, if the vertex set of H is a a subset of the vertex set of G, and then two vertices are adjacent in H, if first of all, they both need to be vertices of H, and secondly, it's if and only if they're adjacent in G, right? So what I'm not allowed to do is just delete an edge. The only way to lose an edge is to delete one of its centers. So there's an example, this is G, this is an induced subgraph of that, because to get this from that, uh, you delete this vertex, this is not an induced subgraph of that because uh, uh, to, to get this from that, you would need to delete this edge and that edge, and that's not an allowed operation. And it suddenly occurred to me, Selena was uh, mentioning all the times I spoke in Latin America, and I think I drew this picture for the first time when I was a graduate student in 2002, and I've always used it to 
give an example of induced subgraphs. I think it might be time for a new for a new induced subgraph. But uh, I don't know. This is, this is what it's been. It's history now. It's tradition. Okay. So anyway. it's very nice. It's very nice, <laughs> Marie. You. Yeah, I, I've been copying and pasting it many times. Um, okay. So that's induced subgraphs, and then. Uh, uh, a family of graphs is hereditary if it's clo close undertaking induced subgraphs, right? So I'm, I'll be, I'll be talking about hereditary families of graphs, meaning families of graphs where if a graph is in, all its induced subgraphs are in. So one of the best known, one of the most well known hereditary families is, is the family of perfect graphs, and let me just remind you, a graph is perfect if for all its induced subgraphs. The chromatic number is the same as the click number, right? And I'll use chi of h to denote the chromatic number and omega of h to denote the click number. Uh, and uh, this is obviously a hereditary family because to be perfect, something needs to happen. You know, the same thing needs to happen for all your induced subgraphs. And it's a family that was uh, studied studied a lot. Uh, there is now an induced subgraph characterization from it, uh, for, for it. Uh, so a graph is perfect if and only if it does not have odd cycles as induced subgraphs and does not have complements of odd cycles as induced subgraphs. And uh, so let's just think about it for a minute. This is, um, so the family of perfect graphs was um, uh, defined by Claude Berger in 1961. And uh, he made some conjectures about these graphs. The, this induced subgraph characterization was one of them, uh, right? And so this is, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an if and only if statement, right? The graph is perfect if and only if this. One direction is clear. For example, if you have a, a perfect graph, you cannot, it cannot have an induced subgraph, which is a node cycle, because in a node cycle, the click number is two, and you cannot color a node cycle with two colors. So a perfect graph cannot contain a node cycle as an induced subgraph. And uh, it's a similar, uh, so slightly more complicated, but not, not very complicated argument that you cannot contain the complement of the induced subgraph or the node cycle as an induced subgraph. So it's clear that if a graph is perfect, then it doesn't contain this and doesn't contain that. And then uh, Berger's uh, insight was that actually these are the only abstractions. The only reason a graph is not perfect, the only reason this is not true, is because you contain one of these or one of those. Uh, so anyway, so this is now a theorem. Uh, and um, uh, so when Bersh defined, defined perfect graphs, that was the definition, but he noticed a lot of other interesting properties that they had. And that's sort of how you know that something is, is a good definition. It's not just uh, what, what you meant to say, but suddenly it has properties that, that, that seem to be surprising and unexpected, but unexpected, but still good. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, that is true about perfect graphs is that you can compute the click number in polynomial time if the input is perfect. It's an NP-complete problem in general, but uh, you can do it in polynomial time on a, on, on, on a perfect graph. And so if you think about this for a minute, that means you can also compute alpha. And then uh, if you think about it a lot, you can prove that you can also find an optimal coloring. Um, but... Um, uh, so, so this is uh, somehow nice and unexpected, right? An algorithmic property that turns out uh, is true if you if you have this. Uh, I one thing I want to say about this this theorem of uh, Groucho, Lois, and Schreiber is that they have a polynomial time algorithm, but the way it works, you write you write the problem the problem as a semi-definite program, and then you use methods from combinatorial optimization to solve the semi-definite program. What you use the ellipsoid method. What we don't yet have is uh, a combinatorial algorithm to answer this question, right? It's a question about graphs. So one would hope you can find an algorithm that, that you can describe in terms of the, of the graph uh, in order to solve all these problems, but that doesn't exist yet. It's one of my favorite problems, but uh, we, don't, we don't have an answer yet. Okay, so. So that I told you about the hereditary family that has a lot of beautiful properties and you might get greedy and you might say, do all hereditary families have nice, have nice properties? And the answer is not at all. Uh, so for example, in perfect graphs, we said the click number and the chromatic number are the same. 
in for all induced subgraphs. In general graph, in, so there are. Let me say it again. In general graphs, the click num the click number could be much much larger. That the chromatic number could be much much larger than the chromatic number. Right, there are graphs with no triangle and arbitrarily large chromatic numbers, and. Uh, even in the hereditary family, right? The family of triangle free graphs is hereditary. So it's a hereditary family where the click number is two and the chromatic number is as big as you can. So we, we can't hope that this uh, coloring property would be true for all hereditary families. Uh, what about uh, algorithms? Well, it's anti complete to find the click number in graphs with no stable set of size three. So again, not this is obviously a hereditary family and uh, the click problem is still anti complete. So it's still not. So not so good either. There is one conjecture uh, that's that's made for all in for all hereditary families. Um, uh, they are the Shinel conjecture. Uh, so let me tell it to you. It's also a lovely problem. Uh, so the conjecture says for every H there exists an epsilon, so that if you look at all graphs that don't contain H, right? So it's a hereditary family defined by not containing this one fixed induced subgraph H, then you have a big clique or a big stable set. Uh, right. so this is a, a notation for a clique. This is a notation for a stable set. How big the number of vertices to this epsilon? So the epsilon depends on the graph that you excluded, but doesn't. But but that's all it depends on. So every graph that doesn't have h has a clique or stable set of this of this size, and that's that's a whole lovely. That tells you that uh, excluding an induced subgraph, which seems like a very local thing to do actually has global ramifications on the graph. Uh, so uh, this is open. I, I'll say something about it uh, toward the end, but this is still open. Uh, Erich and Heinel, when they, in the paper where they made the conjecture, they proved a weaker statement. They proved that, OK, I did just use the word. For every h, there is c of h, so that if Maria, Maria, please. Uh, maybe just a bit larger, please. So you can make my, my window larger. Uh, make yes. Window okay. Larger. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Uh, so if C, if G uh, is H free, right, there's no induced subgraph isomorphic to H and G, uh, then the maximum of alpha and omega and g is at least e to the square root c sub h log the number of vertices of g. Right? So the conjecture says this is polynomial in the number of vertices. The theorem says it's like that. Uh, so really, we are just fighting with the square root. And um, uh, so in the general graph, the number is log the number of vertices. So somehow this theorem already tells you that um, uh, graphs with a forbidden induced subgraph are very different from general graphs because they can already prove that instead of log the number of vertices, it's uh, halfway between uh, halfway to polynomial. Uh, but anyway, but the conjecture is polynomial, and uh, and people are fighting hard over it. Okay. So, uh, so I showed you one slide that uh, was a nice hereditary family. I showed you one slide that said there's nothing good about hereditary families. So let's try and find a place in the middle. And let's ask which hereditary families have nice properties. Uh, and what do I mean by nice properties? Well, I, uh, I uh, uh, disclosed that in my two previous slides, I'm interested in structure and I'm interested in, in efficient algorithms. All right, so what do I mean by structure? Well, there's uh, the notion of treaty composition that somehow everybody agrees is a, good, uh, is a good way to approach structure. So let me remind you what the treaty composition is. And this slide is somehow for a very niche audience. People who know what, what the treaty composition is don't need it. People who don't know what the treaty composition is, I don't think you can learn it in you know, two minutes. So this is for people who once knew but now forgot. Uh, which, which is actually a surprisingly big group. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to kind of also say something intuitive about it. So a treaty composition of a graph means we try to represent a graph G by a tree. And what does it mean represent? 
So I'm going to have a, right, so the graph trees that I'm trying to represent. I'm going to have a tree T, which is my representing tree. And then I'm going to have a map X from the vertices of G to the vertices of T. Uh, so to, right, from, from subsets of vertices of G to the vertices of T. So, okay. so T is a tree. For every vertex of T, I, uh, I assign what we call a bag. This is a subset of the vertices of G. So they're different. They're bags sitting on vertices of T, and, uh, and these bags are filled with uh, vertices of G. And there are two rules. So one rule is every edge of G of the graph you're trying to represent has to be captured in some bag, right? Every edge has to appear at, at, at some vertex of T. Right? So it's this bullet. And the second, the second rule is if I look at the vertex of G and I try to trace where it appears, in which bag it appears, that has to be a subtree. I'll call it the support of the vertex. So every vertex of G, it supports the set of bags where it appears, the set of vertices of T where it appears, needs to be connected, it needs to be a subtree of T. Okay, so let me so let me show you one example, a very simple one. Take a one vertex tree and put all vertices of G on that vertex. So that's that's a tree composition that satisfies uh, all the conditions, right? Every vertex is in a bag, every edge is in a bag, and every vertex is supported on a connected graph. Obviously, that's not exactly what we meant, but, but it is a 3D composition. So now let's do something a little more interesting. Um, so this is a tree, and I'm going to build a 3D composition for it. So I'm going to use the same tree, and, uh, and I've described the bags here, and the way I constructed the bags so I designated the root, and then I say for every vertex, so three is my root. And now for every vertex of the tree, take a path from it to the root, right? Like this is the path from one, this is the path from five. And now for every vertex, in its bag you put it and its parent in the path to the root. So for example, this is one, two is its parent in the path to the root. The bag that I put on, on, on this vertex is one, two. This is four. This is its path to the root. Three is its parent on the path to the root. So uh, for, to, to four, I associate the bag three, four. And so on. And you can check it's a 3D composition. You can also observe that the bags here have size two. I was able to uh, represent my tree with bags of size two. Now, one might argue that this representation is much more complicated than this representation, but that's the price you pay. Uh, okay, so now here's another one. Uh, I take a cycle and I build a tree decomposition of it. You can check that it's a tree decomposition. The tree, uh, the tree is a path, and these are the bags. Hope I didn't mess it up. And here you notice the bags I used were size three, and you can prove that you cannot represent this cycle with bags of size two. So. Somehow the, we are going to measure the complexity of the graph by how how big a bag you need, or alternatively how small. So you, I don't care how huge the tree is, but my goal is to make the bags as small as possible, and that's going to be the complexity that this representation is meant to measure. So the width of a representation is the maximum size of the bag, and then the tree width is the minimum overall representations of the width. Uh, and uh, so here I said maximum size of a bag minus one. Why minus one? Because you want for trees to have tree with one. That seems fair. And yet, if you if you build a tree decomposition, you need bags of size two. And uh, somehow the, we we say if uh, if G has uh, small tree widths, then it's close to being a tree. Okay. So that uh, first tree decomposition I told you about, where you put all the all the vertices on on one vertex. That was a very wasteful tree composition right? that had width the number of vertices of G, which is not so interesting. Okay, so why uh, why uh, do we care about tree decompositions? Well, one very uh, useful thing about tree decomposition is that if you have a graph with bounded tree width, you can you can uh, efficiently solve a lot of problems using a method called dynamic programming, which I'm not going to tell you about. Um, but uh, uh, you can so you can find an optimal coloring. You can find a max weight stable set. Uh, right, just to remind you, a stable set is a set of vertices with no edges between them. So somehow bounded tree widths is you know if a graph has bounded tree widths, it's it's a nice graph. You can do a lot of things with it. And there's a 
a whole line of research. What can you replace bounded tree width with? What if I don't tell you the graph has bounded tree width? Or what if I tell you it has a tree decomposition and the bags have some properties, which are not just small size? Uh, what could these properties be so that you could still design efficient algorithms? And th that's, that's an area I like very much, but, I'm, but this is not the topic of this talk. Um, I, I used to include the include in this talk also, but then I realized then I just don't get to say anything. I say one sentence about every topic. So now it's two talks, and this is not to talk about uh, algorithms with uh, with three decompositions. Okay, so now let me uh, let me give you this talk. Uh, so, which heritage families have bounded triplets? Right, just a very simple question. I just advertised bounded triplets, so then it's a natural thing to wonder which heritage families have bounded to it. Uh, so in order to answer this question, first we need to come up with some examples of things that don't have bounded to it. Uh, and here, here are some. Uh, oh, and one thing I should say, three words and three decompositions are, uh, play, play an important role in the study of graphs with forbidden minors. And there are, there are a lot of things we know from that, right? We know a lot of examples. It doesn't help so much with proving theorems, but it helps a lot with finding counterexamples because they've discovered a lot of graphs of large triplets. Okay, so um, here are some of them. Uh, uh, a big click, big click. There's nothing you can do. It's true. It's, uh, it's size minus one. Big complete vector graph. Um, uh, so this graph is called a wall. It's a cubic graph, and it's called it looks like this. I mean, you can make it as big as you want. It's called the wall. It has big tree widths. And if you subdivide all edges, however you like, that still, that still has um, uh, big tree widths. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, this is the line graph of a wall. Uh, right? So if you replace every vertex by a triangle, then you get the line graph of a wall. And that also has big tree widths. And then again, you can subdivide. So don't subdivide the triangles but subdivide the edges, you know, the other edges, that would be another graph of big two. Now in, in the theory of minors, uh, somehow you never hear about this graph, but the reason you don't hear about this graph is because this is a subgraph of an appropriately chosen graph of that type, uh, but it's not, new, uh, I mean, that way, I'm sorry, I meant to say the, I meant to say that way. This contains as a subgraph an appropriately chosen one of those. But for induced subgraphs, it's not true. For induced subgraphs, these two are uh, incomparable. This is not contained in that, and this is not contained in that. So you have to think of, of the two of them as two different entities. Okay, so this, are, this is some, uh, um, some insights we got from uh, the theory of minors. So if you're looking for a hereditary family with bounded triads, you must exclude you know, a big clique, a big complete back graph, a big one of this, and a big one of those. Uh, and you might hope that this is it, but your hope would be incorrect. Maria? Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. So hereditary, just to emphasize, hereditary, we mean we forbid as induced subgraphs. It, it means it's closed under reduced subgraphs. Yes. Yes, closed. Thank you. Sure. Just to, thank you. yes, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a little unclear to me how induced subgraphs got such a good word. I mean, why, like, why not every ideal is called a hereditary family? It should be, but somehow we grab this word and it's ours now. Okay, so uh, right, so these are these are obvious obstructions for uh, uh, for uh, uh, having bounded triads, but uh, there's a very sad theorem of. Uh, Sintiari and Trotnion that says there are many, many more obstructions. So what they proved is you look at the class of at the class of graphs with no even induced event cycles and no K4, no click of no click of size four. Um, so let's just look here. Uh, so no K4, this this dot is checked. Uh, no C4, so right, no K and N, not even K22. And it's not hard to check if you know what to look for that these and those contain and you can contain even cycles. So certainly this family does not contain any of the obstructions I listed. Uh, 
and, and you know, it's even smaller than that, right? Like, like, with all in, even cycles. And they prove that you can have graphs with uh, arbitrarily large tree width in that family. So, okay, so there are many more obstructions. It's a mess. We don't know what to do. Um, Maria? Uh, yes. There is a, a, a question. So maybe it's, it's good just to, uh, a question that uh, Fabricio asked in, in the, uh, the, the chat. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's good just to give a little more intuition about the tree decomposition. So Fabricio asks, is it the case that the tree decomposition of with one of a tree, graph G, is always isomorphic to G? That is a very good question. It's a very um, good question. Yes, I like it too. That's why I interrupt. Yes. Uh, or, or if you like, we can ask at the end, whatever you prefer. Yes. Yeah, maybe this is, this is, this is since I don't know the answer, let's do it at the end. Uh, it's a good question, right? It's a great good question, question yeah. Fabricio. Yes, thank you. Just, Sorry to interrupt again. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, so I, I doubt I'll figure it out while I'm talking, but uh, but maybe somebody else will. Um, okay. So anyway, so there there are uh, uh, there are many more obstructions, or there's some other obstructions, and we don't know what they are. Uh, but one thing about the example of Cynthia and Jordan Yun is that. They, their graphs had versus a huge degree. So then they said, what if we bound the max degree? And then, then suddenly everything gets much better. So it turns out that uh, if you look at exactly, at, 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 if you look at the class of graphs with no induced even cycles, they're called even whole free graphs, by the way. If you look at the class of even whole free graphs with bounded degree, then it is true that the tree width is bounded as, as a function of the degree. And that's a theorem with uh, my student Tara Abrishami and Christina Bushkovich. Uh, so uh, this, this was conjectured by this group and uh, they also proved it for, uh, for the case when the, the max degree is bounded by three. And I should also notice that uh, this was known for planar even whole free graphs, it's a theorem of uh, Silva. Oops, what did I do? Sorry, pardon me. Um, and uh, one thing I want to mention about their work is that they made a lovely conjecture that if you bond the max, max degree, then the abstractions I gave you, uh, right, the big, big click, big complete vector graph, subdivision over wall and subdivision uh, of the and line graph of the subdivision over wall are the only obstructions you need. So if you bound the max degree, you don't really need to list the first two. I just listed them so that you can see the parallel to the necessary obstructions we found. Uh, right? But if you bound the max degree, then necessarily you don't have big clicks and you don't have big complete back peg graphs. Uh, so, but then if you forbid this and that, they conjecture it's, uh, it has bounded three words, which, which is a lovely, lovely conjecture. Uh, okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, about the proof for even whole free graphs. Uh, right, so even whole free means no induced subgraph, no induced subgraph is, uh, uh, is a whole of even length. And this is a well-studied class of graphs. Uh, you can prove they all have what's called bisimplicial vertices. This vertices, the vertex is bisimplicial if, uh, um, if its neighborhood is a union of two clicks, just as a vertex set, not, not as a graph. And you can deduce that um, uh, that uh, uh, the chromatic number is at most two omega minus one. And I should tell you there was a drama with this theorem. So we published it in 2008. And then uh, two years ago, somebody found a mistake in the proof and a big mistake, a mistake we couldn't fix. So now Paul Seymour and I have another proof, which we submitted for publication in the same journal. And uh, understandably, the freeing process is very slow because they don't want to publish it with a mistake again. But uh, you know, ho ho hopefully it's a theorem. I would say this, uh, this is an 80% theorem. Okay. Uh, so there's a polynomial time recognition algorithm for even whole free graphs, and there are many ways to do it. And I listed some, there are others. Uh, this is the fastest known, Chang and Lu. Uh, there are also decomposition theorems for them. You can prove that uh, even holes are either basic, meaning you can describe an explicit construction, or they admit decompositions, and these are, these are results by 
these two groups, which we'll use. Uh, but there are also a lot of things that are not known about them. Uh, for example, we don't know how to compute alpha. We don't know how to compute the stability number. We can do it, uh, it's a result with those people, if you also forbid a pyramid, right? forbid all graphs that look like this. Um, but, um, uh, but we don't know how to do it in general. Uh, we don't know how to find an optimal coloring. I should say that now with uh, this result, at least we can solve all these questions in even whole free graphs of bounded degree. Okay, so moving on. So now let me, uh, it's gonna be seven minutes about the proof. Um, uh, so, okay, so right, we are now proving the theorem that even whole free graphs of bounded degree have bounded three widths. So three widths have something to do with separations. Let me tell you what the separation is. It's just a partition of the work set into two parts, X and Y, so that there are no edges from x delete y to y delete x, right? You, you know, so the intersection is a cut set in the graph. And the order of a separation is, um, is the size of the intersection. Right? So far, I didn't say anything complicated. I just want to be able to use the word and make sure we all mean the same thing by it. And there's a theory of separations in, uh, in, in the graph manners papers, but I'll only need a tiny little bit from it. Uh, so two separations are non-crossing, if you can kind of line them up. So um, what it roughly means is so this is one separation. And then I can say that the other one is to the left. The other one, the other one is like this. Right, so you see in what in what sense the blue separation is to the left, to the left or to the right, but uh, to the side of the black separation. Right, this is one side of the black separation. It's completely contained in one side of the blue separation. And uh, um, so again, if, if you haven't thought about it, it's not actually obvious. But there's some way to say what it means for two separations to be to be non-crossing and. And it's this, and it doesn't. I'm not going to do anything that would require any intuition for it. So for now, it's just we can just take it as a definition. But what is important to us is that if you have a collection of non-crossing separations, it's called the laminar collection. If you have a collection of non-crossing separations, uh, then you can get a three D composition of the graph where the separations that correspond to um, right. So if you look at the three D composition, does the noise bother you guys? Can you hear my background noise? Are you okay? okay. We are okay, Maria. Noise, no microphone. problem. Good. No Great. problem. Okay. So, but that's noise I can control. But if it doesn't bother you, then it's okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, if you take a tree decomposition and you look at an edge of a tree, what it gives you is a separation in the graph. You look at all the vertices that are mapped to one side of the edge and all the vertices that are mapped to the other side of the edge, and that gives you separation in the graph. A separation in the graph. So then what this theorem says is that if I have a collection of non-crossing separations, then there is a, a tree decomposition where the separations that correspond to the edges are precisely the elements of this collection. Okay, so somehow there is a connection between tree decompositions and non-crossing separations. And we're going to use that. So there are natural decompositions, natural separations that come up in even whole free graphs, also in other hereditary families, that's called a star cut set. So what's a star cut set? It's a cut set in the graph so that some vertex in it is adjacent to everybody else in it, right? You can take a vertex, some of its neighbors, and that disconnects the graph. So for a star cut set, I'm going to have a star separation. It's the cut set plus the left and the cut set plus the right, right? So from a star cut set, I now have a star separation. And now I'm back in the land of the theory of separations. I can talk about crossing ones and non-crossing ones. And until last year, we always said, star cuts that can cross arbitrarily, there's nothing to be done there. But then we noticed a really wonderful thing that if you look at even whole free graphs uh, with max degree delta, then all important star separations and I'll I won't tell exactly what important means, but uh, all the ones you care about, 
can be partitioned into bounded linear laminar collections. So it's true that stark assets can cross, but if you have a graph of bounded degree, then you can partition them into bounded many into bounded many non-crossing ones. And uh, here I say it for uh, uh, even Hofer graphs. We have since been able to strengthen this quite significantly. Uh, so you can weaken the notion of non-crossing. You don't quite need so much. And then this is true in any graph of bounded degree. Uh, so somehow it's uh, really something's going on there. This completely wild separations, you can still you can tame them, you can partition them into boundedly many tame collections. Okay, uh, so that's the first theorem. And the reason is in, in quotation marks is because, because of important. And um, there's also something else I'm not telling you, you need double star cuts at also, but let's, for people who know it, uh, I don't want to cheat you, but for people who don't know it, let's pretend they don't exist. Um, okay, so then the second theorem uh, is a theorem of Le that says if, if you don't have a star cut set, then the triads is bounded by uh, by a function of delta, by a function of max degree. The reason this one is in quotation marks is because Le doesn't actually prove that he proves he proves it for click width. But then you can use known results and, and immediately did use this. So it's uh, basically due to Le. Okay, so that's what we have. If there's no star cut set at all, we already know the result, and star cut sets are partitioned into boundary many lambda collections. So then uh, we can define the star cut set separa uh, this separation dimension of a graph, right? That's how many laminar collections you need to, to cover all important star cut sets. And uh, now I can do induction uh, on uh, the star on the sorry, yeah, on the star separation dimension. So here's the induction. Uh, so there's one other trick we use. Uh, 3D composition is a hard. But there is a theorem of Harry and Wood that says that instead of looking at 3D compositions, you can look at something that's easier to grasp. So they want to think about something called balanced separators. What that means is I have a, a weight function on the, on the vertices of the graph. That's, that's W. And let's uh, normalize it. Let's make it sum up to 1. And then a WCD balanced separator so x is a WCD balance separator if x is small, x, x has size at most d, and for every component of g, of g delete x, the weight of that component is not too big, is at most c. So that's a WCD balance separator, right? You can delete a small set of vertices and the weight is more or less balanced. You don't have all the weight sitting in one component. And Harwin would prove that if for every uh, w, you have a WCD balance separator, then the two is bounded. The two is bounded by a function of C and D. So instead of trying to bound the two we're going to prove that they're balance separators. All right. Okay, so now I can tell you the proof. So we prove there exists C um, uh, and, and, and some D. D depends on delta. Uh, C also depends on delta. So that for every even whole free graph of um, uh, of max degree at most delta, and for every normalized function like that, G has a WCD balance separator, right? And how do you do that? Uh, so this is the last, last slide. Um, okay, so you have a, this function from the vertex set of the graph to zero, 01. If star separation dimension is zero, then, oops, about that. if star separation dimension is zero, then uh, you have bounded tree width, and it's a theorem that you can delete a bag to get bounded, um, uh, to get uh, um, a balance separator. That's not hard. Um, so dimension zero, we're done. Now we can do induction. So star uh, separation, star separation dimension k. Take one laminar collection, use the Robertson and Seymour theorem to get the three D composition for this laminar collection. Right. So the separations on the edges are are in this laminar collection. And then it turns out that you can, one of the bags of the separation, we call it the central bag, has a fantastic property. It has lower star separation dimension. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it seems like a miracle, but it's actually not hard to show. Uh, so there's one bag that has a lower star separation dimension. And then, you know, it's a 3D composition. So the rest of the graph attaches to this bag very nicely. Um, uh, 
uh, so you can arrange that every other component is small. I guess that's another miraculous property of this bag. Not only does it have a small star separation dimension, but also all the other components have weight at least have weight at least c, and they all attach on on star separations. So what connects you know this component to this bag is just uh, a subset of a, of a subset of a star because it's it came from a star separation. Okay, so that's pretty nice. So this thing gives me a uh, uh, you know if I delete all of this, at least that breaks the graph into balanced components. It's not a, a WCD balance separator yet, but it's a good start. But then you can prove it. Since I have a slide of this paper yet, so then you can prove, and I'm not going to show you the proof, but it's 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 not hard. So Inductively, this bag has a, a, a bounded, uh, you know, well, it's, it's okay. Inductively, this bag has a WC um, uh, what it Ah, this is a type of my apologies. Inductively, this bag has a balance separator which corresponds to degree delta and dimension k minus one. So it says delta of dk minus one, it should say d of delta k minus one. And that's the C is the same, but the size of the separator is small. It's, uh, it's, uh, it depends on delta and K, it's a function of delta and K minus one. And then you can prove that if you take the neighborhood of the separator, that gives you WCD separator in the whole graph. So let me maybe quickly draw a picture for that. So I have my central bag and there are components attaching to it. And you can prove that if you have a separator here, so it's a W, C, D, uh, and D is a function of delta and K minus one balance separator, say this called X. And then you take the neighborhood of X. And the neighborhood of X is a W, C, D, delta. Oh, it's, it's a balance separator, it's a balanced separator in G. And you can see that it didn't grow too much. You can see that you know it's a graph of degree delta. So if I take the neighborhood of a small set, all I did was multiply the size by delta. So that's that's the point I'm trying to make, that the size doesn't grow too much because all you do is take the neighborhood of a small set. And that's the proof. All right, uh, I seem to have time. Okay, so let me just very quickly switch gears and say something about their final conjecture. Uh, uh, so, okay, so just to remind you, and then the reason I want to say it, I want to mention it is because somehow 3D compositions and induced subgraphs are not thought of being friends, uh, but, but it sounds like maybe they are if you just uh, can do it the right way. So I want to show you an application of that for, uh, for I should also tell you that it has seen been, since been surpassed, but it was nice while it lasted and maybe uh, maybe something else along those lines can be done. So, but let me, uh, let me go through. So the Erdős Island conjecture says, um, uh, right, for every H there's an epsilon so that uh, this maximum is polynomial in the, in the number of vertices. And there's a stronger thing you can ask for. Instead of asking for a clique or stable set, which is polynomial in the size of the graph, you can ask for two subsets which are linear in the size of the graph, but I, I uh, require that either there are no edges between them or all the edges between them are present. So somehow it's structurally more loose because I'm not asking for a clique or a stable set, I'm just asking for two sets, complete or anti-complete to each other, but I want them to be bigger. Polynomial is not enough, I want them to be linear. And it turns out that if you can get this, then you can get that. So you know, proving this property is, uh, is good enough. On the negative, on the minus side, uh, this is very rarely true. Um, okay. So you could, if you didn't know that this is almost never true, you could try to prove that graphs with forbidden induced subgraphs have three widths bounded by CN, by a linear function of the vertices. And if that were true, it's not easy to, it's not hard to show that there's a bag you can delete to get a balanced separation, and that would give you two sets anti-complete to each other. 
So the problem is, uh, I mean, it, it, it is maybe a nice approach, but it's not going to tell you anything new because the only time where this stronger property is true, you have two anti-complete sets or two complete sets, is when what you exclude is a tree and the complement of a tree. And that's already known. It's already known that uh, uh, if you exclude a tree, a tree and its complement, then um, then uh, uh, then you have uh, either this outcome or that outcome. So it's somehow it's it's, it's a nice approach, but uh, uh, but you're not going to get anything new using it. Okay. So, but let's keep thinking about trivets. All right. So this is this is a slide that says. Uh, uh, this approach of trying to get small trivets is not going to help you because uh, ev everything that you might prove this way is already known. Okay, so, but what about, remember at the very beginning I said small trivets is very nice, but maybe if I can say something else about the bags, that's also useful. So what if we combine that? What if we try to prove that if I exclude something, then every bag is either small, right, sublinear, or it's simple. So then what would happen? Well, there's still the bag that breaks my graph into two equal parts. If this, ba if this bag happens to be sublinear, or like not sublinear, at most C and at most 99% of the graph, then fantastic. Then I have uh, what's called a strong gravitational property, two sets anti-complete to each other. Well, maybe this, big is, this bag is big. But then, right, my other outcome, it has a simpler structure. Well, if I have a big sub subgraph in my graph that has a simpler structure, that's also good enough for me because then you can just, uh, uh, so simple structure in this case means something for which I already know the outcome of Rajashainov. So then if I have a big subset and I already know that it has a big click or stable set, that's a big click or stable set in the whole graph. Uh, so somehow you can play them against each other. And uh, using this idea, Paul Simmer and I were able to prove that if you forbid holes with a hat, right? So, uh, you know what a hole is, and a hole with a hat is a hole in the vertex with two consecutive neighbors in it. So if you forbid them all, then that's exactly what we got. We got a treaty composition where every bed was either s small or it didn't contain uh, more or less. Maria? Yes. Do we call them caps? Uh, sometimes we do. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so you get a bag that doesn't contain this. So it's two four vertex paths and all the edges between them are present. So you have a, if you have a larger bag that doesn't contain this, that's also good for you because you know that that has that shine. So even if you have a subset of the size V of G to the delta that doesn't contain that, that's still great because uh, this has a click or a stable set of size. And, uh, I think um, uh, and to the one six, maybe one twelve, or something. I don't remember, but some some small constant. Uh, so that was that was that proof, and it was very nice while well, it lasted. And I should tell you that uh, by now, with Sophie Spurkel and Alex Scott, were able to prove to strengthen this. It's uh, now we know Erdős Hajnal if you just exclude caps of lengths four and five. This and that, uh, and then the method is completely different. Uh, it's kind of more traditional at the channel method. And maybe the last thing I want to tell you is that we also very recently proved that the channel for excluding C5. And that's the that result was uh, uh, Paul Seymour, Alex Scott, and Sophie Purple. And it, it was a problem people cared about, so I, I wanted to tell you about it. Uh, okay, but I think this is enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, let's thank Maria for the beautiful talk. Please uh, turn your, your... Well, please say something. Carla, Yoshiko, let's thank. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Selena, you're muted. Your mic is muted, Selena. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Yes, I th <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. It's very good to have a speaker who helps the chair. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> so, uh, so we have many questions, and I just start uh, with one, and then see if people want to is speak themselves or not. But Nicola uh, asked. I never know whether it's Nicola, Nicola. I assume that's Nicola, but let's see. Uh, do three decompositions of a tree uh, correspond to a, a death first search of the tree? Oh, you guys will ask good questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably, I, I'm sorry. I... I have an answer for the <laughs> other one because you see, uh, your, 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 your talk generated a lot, a lot of movement in the chat and, and questions and, uh, and answers as well. So uh, regarding that other question by Fabricio, uh, there was a, an answer that uh, in case, uh, what's the answer again, Fabricio? Maybe you want to talk, otherwise I, ca I, can, I can talk. The, the example was of a star. Fabricio, do you want to speak? If not, uh, that any star has uh, with one path decomposition. So that would be an example that is not isomorphic. It's a nice example. Do you like the yes. example? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. It is a nice example. <laughs> yes, it's, it's nice. Uh, any more questions or, or comments, please? Uh, I have another one, uh, Juan. He, he mentioned uh, that. Uh, he has. If a graph has bounded uh, bounded degree, then mm -hmm. it is all. It it also has bounded three width. But then Cristina Fernandes answered that no, the wall is cubic and has a bit very large three width. Yes. And uh, uh, maybe uh, oh yes, there is another. Uh, ah, there is another comment that just appeared in the chat. Can you specify a little bit about the function involved in the upper bound for three width in the slides since it was a function of some parameter? Uh, Does it make sense? Uh, Juan, maybe you can help me. It, it, this is, I read what is written in, in the- So do, do you mean for uh, even whole three graphs, it's a function of delta, it's a function of the max degree. Yes, I don't know. Maybe people because oh, usually we, we use yeah. large delta and small delta, but the small delta you you mean large delta, right? The maximum degree. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. One, is it clear for? Please go ahead. Uh, Juan, does it answer your question? Uh, oh, I, I, I guess I see it now. I, can you specify a little yes, bit about the function you. involved in the upper bound? Uh, okay. Um, uh, it, it, so I can tell you it's complicated. Uh, it's not. It's not polynomial. Uh, it might be exponential. Uh, it only depends on delta. Uh, it only depends on delta. Uh, so delta is a constant. So the three width is uh, bounded by a, by a constant. Then that's right. I mean the way you prove the theorem, you you prove that it depends on delta and the star separation dimension, but the star separation dimension itself was a function of delta. So just a sort of a convenient trick to separate these two. Uh, 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 yeah, just that. I want to know every, every parameter in that function is, is a constant. So there's no n involved or? That's right. Ah, OK. Cristina has a question, Maria, for you. Please, Cristina. Uh -huh. Hi, Maria. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, in the previous slide, when you were, I like very much this thing of uh, either having a small bag or a simple bag that might be big. Uh, and then the last, very last theorem you showed. So you said you guys managed to prove that when you forbid the caps and the, uh, then you have this, this thing of small bags or simple bags. Did, did, maybe I missed it, but did you say what simple in that case was? So simple more or less means, can you see my board? Yeah, yes, I can. Yeah. So simple more or less means no four or x path uh, complete to each other. 
it's a little more complicated than that, but. Uh, so say it again, please, because it was increasing your board. So, simple means, more or less, you don't have two four vertex paths with all the edges between them. Okay. It, it, it's a little more complicated than that because really what it is, is you can, you have a homogeneous set. You know what that is? It's a set where every vertex outside is complete or anti-complete to it. Right. So mm -hmm. you, it's a graph that has some homogeneous set. And once you squish them to singletons, then you don't have this. Okay. Okay. But it's good enough. You can still prove at a channel for a graph like that. Okay. 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 But it, yeah, the, it's not a straightforward, simple in this case, but it's what you needed to prove the, the, right. the rest, right? right? Very nice, this Thank you. idea. Thank you. Now I invite uh, Guilherme to show a comment from Flavia Bonomo from University oh, of Buenos Aires, uh, co-author of Maria. So Maria, happy birthday. So Flavia Bonomo could not be here, but she wants to be here, of course. Ah. So uh, she prepared uh, some fo photos. So let's show uh, to remember all these times that you were here. So thank you for your cooperation with Latin America in Latin American events. That is so nice. Uh, I, will sh I will send you afterwards. Thank you. With a message to, don't worry, just enjoy, enjoy. We want you to enjoy, yes. So, so first in Chile, remember 2004 in Chile, yeah. the prehistory of, of the, the library sour. series. Yes, and then in Rio de Janeiro, you see the sugar loaf and among these uh, very high mountains, there we were for the mathematical programming conference. And then, uh, again in Chile uh, for the Lagos 2007 conference, and then you were there again. And then you visited uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. You visit Flavia, so she has a beautiful I have to show photo. You something, just a minute. Yes. <laughs> I think uh, Flavia will be pleased. Oh, Flavia will be pleased. <laughs> Thank you. You are very kind. Thank you. <laughs> very nice. Yes. And then, uh, well, Lagos 2017, when we honored uh, Jaime and Tom, and then you were there. I consider that Latin America, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, in uh, 2018, in IMPA. So maybe that was the photos you were mentioning. Absolutely. That was the one. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't say anything not to spoil the surprise. <laughs> but... I'm very impressed. It's not the way at all. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then today, yes. Thank so you so we, much. we are very grateful, Maria, we are very grateful. So <laughs> feel always welcome to come back and please keep being such a beautiful person. Oh, thank you so much. This is so nice yes, of you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's thank our uh, uh, speaker again. You may sing if you like, you may sing, okay? Shall we sing? Uh. Guilherme? Uh, sure, sure. Okay, in Portuguese, in English, you lead. <laughs> Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, what a lovely, what a lovely birthday. I have to say from now on, all my birthdays will be in countries in South America. They don't do that in other ways. <laughs> uh, yes, next time in person. Yes. That's Thank you so mean. much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to sign off. Is that good? Yes, now our, our host, Guilherme, do you have any instructions, please? So now, now we should, uh, I mean, uh, you can go back to the system and we have a poster section. So you can go there and enjoy the posters uh, people submitted. Thanks a lot for your talk, Maria. Thank you Thanks, very Alina, much. Thanks, for sharing with us. Thank you very much. I will send you the card made by Yoshiko and the presentation made by Flavia, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you.
<laughs> All right. And you send us bye -bye. this. The presentation was beautiful. And you send us the slides. The okay. Uh, if I, I'm a little distracted today. So if I forget, could you remind me, please? But I'll... no, please don't. Today, please enjoy your day. It's your day. <laughs> Sounds good. We are very happy to be with you. Very happy. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye.